Okay, so I'll start with an outline of what we will be going over in these videos. So first I'm going to start with the anatomy of the heart, just going over like the electrical structures and the autorhythmic cells. And then we'll talk about the two unique action potentials that exist in the heart. Then I'll introduce what uh, a normal EKG wave looks like and everything that an EKG can tell us. And then we'll go through some EKG pathologies and then get to the actual worksheet at the end. So let's start with the anatomy of the heart. So I've uh, pulled this picture and it just shows really the autorhythmic cells of the heart, the conducting system of the heart. So autorhythmic cells are one of two types of cells in the heart. The other type is contractile cells. So autorhythmic cells are all of these structures that exist uh, right here that are written on the side. So it starts with the SA node. And these are called autorhythmic cells because they um, automatically generate their own rhythm. You might have also heard them called pacemaker cells because they set the pace for the heart. They set the heart rate. So the thing that is unique about these autorhythmic cells is that they can spontaneously generate their own action potentials. And we'll look at how a little bit later. But the first place where the action potential of the heart begins is the SA node. You will typically hear this being the primary pacemaker of the heart. So the SA node will create its own action potential, and this is found in the right atrium. And that action potential will travel through the internodal pathways or internodal fibers, which are found throughout the right and left atria. So the job of the SA node is to depolarize both of the atrium together, or both of the atria together and the internodal fibers or internodal pathways help the spread of the depolarization through both chambers. So once it goes through both atria, we'll end up on the AV node. The AV node stands for atrioventricular node. So it's the node right in between the atria and the ventricles. So the AV node, when it gets the electrical signal, it doesn't immediately depolarize. It will take a brief pause. This is called the AV node delay, and this will be important later when we're looking at an EKG. So the AV node will just take a brief pause, and that is just to make sure that both atria have fully depolarized before moving on to the ventricles. All right, so then the AV node, which is right here, will send this depolarization down the septum of the ventricles. Septum is just the word for that wall in between the two ventricles. And it'll send it through a structure called the AV bundle. If you've studied um, electrical anatomy of the heart before, you may have heard the AV bundle called the bundle of Hiss. It's the same thing here. It's just called the AV bundle. So that uh, AV bundle will go towards the apex of the heart, which is just the kind of bottom tip of the heart. And then once it reaches the apex, it'll spread outwards and upwards through structures called Purkinje fibers. So then these Purkinje fibers is what are actually going like into the ventricle muscle itself to cause both of the ventricle muscles to depolarize and eventually contract. So it's important to know this order, right? Like SA node is first, internodal fiber is the second, this is third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on. Right? It, it goes in this specific order because it follows the anatomy. All right, so let's talk about autorhythmic cells and their action potentials. So maybe pause the video real quick and draw out an axis for you uh, or for yourself and label it how I've labeled it so far. And the graph that we are about to do is the autorhythmic action potential. Okay, so the autorhythmic action potential, like I had said earlier, these cells are unique because they can spontaneously generate their own action potential. So down here at minus 60, um, 
when we were looking at the action potential of a regular neuron, we said, okay, the neuron is not being stimulated, so it's just kind of at a flat line down here at resting membrane potential. But in a cardiac autorhythmic cell, it does not have a resting membrane potential. Instead, when it's at the bottom here at minus 60, it will just immediately start to depolarize and go towards membrane threshold, right? So that dashed line, just like in the neuron graph, the dashed line represents the membrane threshold. So once this cell reaches membrane threshold, it will have a fast depolarization and fast repolarization, which is the action potential portion. But we see here, like I said, again, it does not have a resting membrane potential. It just immediately starts to depolarize. So again, like when we studied this in a neuron, you needed to know what channel and what ions were responsible for every part of the graph. And it's going to be the same thing for the autorhythmic cells. So right at the bottom here, at minus 60, we will get funny channels opening. So funny channels open down here at minus 60. So funny channels, you'll often see them written as maybe IF, which stands for funny current, right? I being current, subscript F being funny. And this is the actual scientific name of the channel. Like I'm not just making this up. It, it is actually called funny channel or IF channel. So these channels are often called hyperpolarized gated channels. So they are a form of a voltage gated channel, but they don't act like any other voltage gated channels that we have seen so far in our body, right? Most voltage gated channels respond to a depolarization, but the funny channel responds to a hyperpolarization. So down here, once the cell reaches minus 60, that's the trigger or the, the voltage needed to open the gate of the funny channel. Okay, so the funny channels act very similar to a nicotinic acetylcholine channel that we studied in unit three, right? So if we remember back to the autonomic discussion and lecture, the nicotinic acetylcholine channel was a nonspecific monovalent cation channel. So same thing here with the funny channels. That means we will have sodium come in and potassium leave the cell. And again, just like the nicotinic channel, the sodium efflux, sorry, the sodium influx, the sodium influx outweighs the potassium efflux. So the net result is a slow or gradual depolarization. So the funny channels will work starting down here at minus 60 up until just before the membrane threshold. So right there where I put those two blue lines, that's where the funny channels are acting. So then what is responsible for this last little bit of depolarization? This is voltage, voltage gated calcium channels. Calcium will come in and finish off that depolarization, making the cell reach membrane threshold. So once we've reached membrane threshold, we have the very quick depolarization. So this part is depolarization. And I'll be more specific here, I'll say fast depolarization. And again, the channel responsible for this was the same as before. It's those voltage gated calcium channels, which means calcium moves in. So this is something unique about the autorhythmic action potential as well. It uses a calcium depolarization. If you remember back to the neuron, the neuron used a sodium depolarization, but autorhythmic cells using a calcium, calcium depolarization. Okay, so after it depolarizes up here at the top, so I'm gonna put, see I'll change colors, I'll put a little dot up here. So right here at the top, 
voltage gated calcium clothes and voltage gated potassium open. So this was also similar to a neuron, right? At the very top of the depolarization in the neuron, the voltage gated sodium channels closed and the voltage gated potassium channels open. But now that we're in the autorhythmic cell, it's the voltage gated calcium channels that close and voltage gated potassium channels that open. So the nice thing here is that the repolarization is very similar to the neuron repolarization in that it is just a voltage gated calcium, sorry, potassium, not calcium, voltage gated potassium channel where potassium moves out, causing a repolarization down here to plus 60, sorry, minus 60. All right, so now that we've gotten back down to minus 60, like I said before, minus 60 is the voltage that is required to open the gate of the funny channels. So when we get down here, it will just immediately start to depolarize again. And then we will have the fast depolarization, fast repolarization, gets down here to the bottom, and then just immediately starts to go again. So this is a cycle. This is the cardiac cycle in terms of the electrical activity of the heart. So this is important because this means that our heart does not need any neuronal influence in order to beat, right? It spontaneously generates its own action potentials. Now, the heart does have neuronal influence because we can increase and decrease our heart rates with parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. But in order for the heart to contract, it actually doesn't need those two nervous systems. It can do it on its own just based off of the autorhythmic cells. Okay, so now let's look at the other type of action potential in the heart, which is contractile cells. So again, if you wanna draw yourself a axis and label it with these two numbers on it, that would be helpful so you could follow along. So the action potential of the contractile cells is also pretty unique from other action potentials that we've seen in the past, like a neuron. So the first thing with the, the cardiac contractile cells is it does actually have a resting membrane potential. So it's down here at rest. And then you've noticed here that I haven't drawn a dashed line for a membrane threshold, that's because the cardiac contractile cells do not need to cross a membrane threshold in order to depolarize. When they get the signal to depolarize, they will just immediately depolarize. Let me color code this. Let's see, on the last one I did orange, so I'll do orange again here. So it will immediately depolarize up here. So this is depolarization. And it is due to a voltage gated sodium channel opening, which means sodium comes in. So that's step one of the contractile cell. So after the depolarization, we would normally just see the quick repolarization, right? Right back down to resting membrane potential. But we don't see that in this case we see that the membrane potential will come down a little bit, but then it will plateau. I'm actually gonna change colors on this just to make it different from repolarization. So it'll come down a little bit, but then it will plateau. So this plateau is due to voltage gated calcium channels opening, which means calcium comes in. So calcium comes in and it maintains the positive charge that the depolarization created. Now I know that there's a little dip here. We're not really going to talk about what causes that little dip. It's technically a bit of potassium leaving here. Um, and then the plateau is due to calcium coming in and less potassium leaving. So the net result is no change in potential. 
So don't don't worry too much about this little dip. Just worry more about the actual plateau itself because the plateau is what's more important here. So the flat line is due to calcium coming in. In the slides, the picture shows that this is due to increased calcium. Sorry, let me write this different. Increased permeability to calcium and decreased permeability to potassium, which is true. So there are some potassium channels open here, but very few. So potassium was leaving during this little part right here, but less potassium is now leaving during the plateau. And more calcium is coming in. And again, the net result is a maintain or maintenance of the positive charge, and you get a plateau. So this is called a calcium plateau. And then after the plateau is done, I'll go back to purple, we get repolarization back down to rest. And just like a neuron and a autorhythmic cell, this is due to voltage-gated potassium channels opening and potassium leaves. So that means right here at like the end of the plateau and beginning of the repolarization, we had the calcium channels close and potassium channels open. All right, I haven't worried too much about the x-axis here on these two graphs. I will mention it though for the contractile cell. Oops. So I will mention the time for the contractile cell. So in order to get from rest back to resting membrane potential, so if this was like zero, then it would take 200 milliseconds for it to finish one action potential. So relative to the neuron that we talked about in unit two, a neuron's action potential lasted about two milliseconds total, right? Resting membrane potential to resting membrane potential took about two milliseconds. But here it's taking 200 milliseconds, so it's much longer. So this calcium plateau is a protective mechanism for the heart because what this calcium plateau does is it prolongs the refractory period of the cardiac contractile cells, which is a good thing because this prevents heart muscle cramps. So the long refractory period prevents your heart muscle from cramping. The scientific term for that is muscle tetanus, T-E-T-A-N-U-S, tetanus. So calcium plateau or the long refractory period prevents cardiac muscle tetanus, which is the contraction without relaxation, right? also known as a cramp. So this is a good thing, right? We don't want our heart muscle to cramp because if it cramped and it contracted but never relaxed, then that means no more blood flow is moving through the body, which is not good. So this is the protective mechanism. It also sets a cap on your maximum heart rate. If anyone's ever done like a VO2 max test or something, um, you've probably reached pretty close to what your max heart rate will be generally max heart rate is 220 minus your age so that will be roughly your max heart rate and, and again that's kind of an estimate um, but yeah if you've ever done like a vo2 max test you probably got your heart rate upwards of like 185 195 maybe even over 200 um, but the point is our max heart rate is not 300 beats per minute or 400 beats per minute it can never go that high because of the long refractory period in a contractile cell. Alright, so I'm going to end part one here and we'll pick up part two with the start of EKG.